church family you can stay seated we're going to sing and do some scripture this morning Colossians 1 for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross the choir is going to sing of his redemption Forever I am 
hard to hear over top of the music, but if you're not standing, would you do so? We're going to join together now and sing of our testimony out of that redemption. We are more than conquerors through those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. condemnation now there is no guilt or shame for those who have been covered by the blood of Jesus and now the words of our accuser have been robbed of all their power and the enemy has been defeated by the blood of Jesus. So we stand with our hearts washed clean, and we lift up our hands and sing. We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. God, if you are for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors, we are more than conquerors, God if you are for us, who can be against us, what can separate us from your love? Once we were the slaves and prisoners, now we're children of the King, the favored sons and daughters saved by the blood of Jesus. So tell me, death, where is your victory? Tell me, grave, where is your sting? Come on! You've been swallowed up in life forever by the blood of Jesus. And we stand as the ones redeemed, as we lift up our hearts and sing. We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. God, if you are born. This is what happens by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, the enemy did, has left, and he will be, will be defeated. Tell it to him, church. By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, 
God, if you are for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. God, if you are for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. God, if you are for us, who can be against us? What can How many of you need to declare that today? If you are for us, God, who can be against us? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to find someone and answer that question to them. We ask the question so many times in that song. God, if you're for us, who can be against us? So when you shake someone's hand, answer it for them. And here's the hint. No one. <laughs> As you've made your way back to your seats, would you please be seated and turn your attention to the screens. Good morning and welcome to Thomasville Road Baptist Church. If you're new with us, we want you to feel at home and know that we're so glad to have you here and that there's a place that's perfect for you at TRBC. One of the best ways to get connected with us is to scan that QR code that can be found on the pew rack in front of you to find our digital bulletin. Just pull up the camera on your phone and hit the link when it pops up. If you're worshiping with us online, here's the code so that you can check it out as well. Once you're there, you'll find ways you can connect with us, including a place to give us some more info on you online so that we can stay in touch and any other upcoming events around the church. You can access what's happening today by checking out our e-bulletin. You can take notes along with the pastor's sermon through the YouVersion Bible app. Or you can find access to our online giving page. Now, if you're new with us, please don't feel any obligation to give. We're just so glad that you're here with us. If you did come prepared to give, you can either do that online through our giving page or here in the worship center at the Great Baskets on each of the exit doors. You can drop your gift off there on your way out. We're so glad you're here to worship the Lord today, and we can't wait to grow together with you as we continue helping people find and follow Jesus right here at TRBC. Good morning. We are glad you are here today, whether you're here with us in person or if you're online with us. I do want to give you one little quick announcement. Um, we have had a multitude of young people get engaged or married recently in our church, which is a great thing. Um, and so we are beginning a class next Sunday morning uh, for young marrieds, engaged couples, newlyweds. Uh, that will be at 1045, like all of our other small groups. So they will meet in 202, which is upstairs in the fellowship hall. So they're going to meet in the fellowship hall, 202. They will meet upstairs above the fellowship hall. Uh, Bobby Sprinkle, Wendy Sprinkle, and Brian Peters are going to be leading that class, and we are just excited about that. If you want more information, you can call me this week. I'd be glad to tell you about that, but I just want to let you know about that class. So if you know somebody, you can invite them to that class as well. Right now, I want to take a moment to bring out Don Gamash and Chris Gamash. <clears throat> a lot of you all don't ever see Don and Chris. You see Chris every once in a while because he gets up here and does solos, but they sit back there and they work in our orchestra or play in our orchestra, and Chris Lee has led our orchestra for 15 years? 21. 
Tw sorry, 21. Yeah, see, time flies. Yeah. So 21 years, and, and, and Dawn has been leading our fitness ministry for the last five years. And just a little quick history about six years ago or so, I, I was sitting there going, it'd be great if we could get some kind of fitness ministry going. Just didn't have a person to lead it. And it's a hard, it's a lot of work. And Dawn came to me, and, and actually Dawn came to me through somebody else and said, Dawn's kind of scared to talk to you, but she wants to know about starting a fitness ministry. And I said, yes. And she came, and she had just got done leaving a fitness ministry that had closed down in town, and she was excited about doing it. We had an opportunity to buy some spin bikes that was going to start off the whole ministry. Uh, we ended up buying 10 spin bikes that turned into an entire ministry where we have spinning classes, we have flexibility classes, we have Pilates classes, we have senior adult classes, we have core classes, we have a boot camp class, and Dawn oversees all that, and she has been an incredible um, leader of that ministry, and so we just want to recognize her, but I also want to recognize Chris for two things. One is we think we forgot to bring him up here on his 20th anniversary and recognize him, so we're going to recognize him as well for 20 years of helping direct and guide our orchestra, but also Chris has been an incredible support to Dawn in all this. Like She does this ministry, but Chris is the one that fixes bikes and does all the technical stuff and takes care of all that, so we just want to thank you all for that ministry. That ministry has really reached... <clears throat> Yeah, 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 you can stand. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> this, this ministry has been one of those really unique ministries where it does help our church because it helps keep us fit and well. And, and, and Dawn revolutionized the snack table at our office. None of us ever eat anything anymore because she gives us dirty looks. But... Uh, and, uh, but it also has been an incredible outreach to our community. And so we just thank you and just uh, wanted to give you a little token of our appreciation. And we love you both. And thank you very much. All right. Welcome to you. Now we're going to take, a, take our offering. Uh, you can, we're going to pass around our offering place, but you can also always give your offering at the doors as well in the little baskets there. But let me pray for us, and then we'll take our offering. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the gamashes. I thank you for Dawn and for Chris and just the ministry that they have. I thank you for their friendship. I thank you for the ways that they have uh, helped lead our church in different areas, but also, Lord, just their servants' hearts, and they're just uh, uh, the heart to, to do what you've called them to do and to be obedient to that, and, and Lord, just the heart to reach those outside of our church as well. And Lord, we just thank you for these types of ministries, and Lord, we thank you for the offerings that we take that allow us to do these type of ministries. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that as we take this offering, Lord, that as we give back to you for all that you have given to us, Lord, that we would use that in a way that uh, brings glory to you and brings your, and sends your truth to the people that need it most, Lord, and just allows us to continue to do the ministry that you have called us to do. It's in your holy precious name we pray. Amen. Our Wednesday night Bible study has started a brand new series. Primary takes a look at the core beliefs of the Christian faith and will help you understand how to put them into practice. As always, we meet Wednesdays at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Next Sunday, we'll be starting a new small group for engaged, newlywed, and young married couples during our Sunday morning small group time at 1045 in room 202 on the second floor of the Fellowship Hall. For more information, you can reach out to Steve Vaughn. Pumpkin Spice has taken over the world, and that means candy season is right around the corner. We'll be holding our annual Trunk or Treat event on Wednesday, October 26. That of course means we need two things, trunks and treats. We need your candy donations, and we need individuals and small group classes to decorate their trunks for kids to enjoy. And as always, we can use many other general volunteers to help make this event possible. Reach out to Nicole Curtis if you're interested in joining in on the fun. Speaking of volunteers, we have amazing news. Our Sunday morning children's attendance is visibly growing each and every week. We could always use more help on Sunday mornings. If you could give up even just one Sunday a month, that would make a huge difference. And we can't repeat it enough. Even if the prospect of working with children terrifies you, we could still use your help in lots of other ways that don't involve directly serving in the classrooms. Take the leap and ask Nicole Curtis how you can help. Connect Women's October meeting will be taking place on Tuesday, October 4th, where I'll be sharing about the many different ways the Lord renews our body, spirit, and mind. Dinner starts at 6 and the program is at 6.30 and you can sign up online.
like a quick change from announcements to being live on the stage, right? <laughs> I would love to have you join us at Connect Women on October 4th. So would you stand up? We're going to continue in worship this morning through the reading of the word. First John chapter 2, starting verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. When we are more than conquerors with our testimony, we have to go. We have to do the will of our Father, and that is to proclaim his salvation to the world. For the cause of Christ the King, we give our lives an offering till all the earth resounds with ceaseless praise to the Son. For the cause of Christ we go with joy to reap, with faith to sow, as many see and many put their trust in the Son. Christ we proclaim the name of God. to the world when we know that we have the hope that they so desperately need. So this last verse, I just pray that you would pray it with us as we sing. Pray it with me. Let it be my life's refrain to live is Christ, to die is gain. Deny myself, take up my cross, and follow the sun. Let it be my life's refrain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Deny myself, take up my cross, and follow the sun. Oh, God. 
we proclaim that together as we continue with scripture first chronicles 29 verses 12 through 14 both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all in your hand are power and might and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all and now we thank you our god and praise your glorious name but who am I, and what is my people that we should be able to us to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. We go, we are redeemed, all these things together today, because he sustains us. We lay down and sleep, and we awake because the Lord sustains. So we turn our breath back to him in ceaseless praise, church. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken.
And you are greatly to be praised. In you, we live and move and have our being. And we take no breath that you haven't given to us, God. Thank you. Thank you. Teach us to pour that breath back out in praise to you in everything we say and do so that you can have the glory, God. In your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. We have the pleasure every once in a while of having uh, Mark and Amy Gwartney here. They are actually kind of officially members of our church. They are related to Scott and Kathy Gwartney. It's Scott's brother, but Mark is going to come up and share a little bit uh, with us. He, uh, they are missionaries to Uganda, um, and so they're going to just tell us kind of how things have been going of late and share a little bit with us before we start our sermon. Good morning, and thank you, Steve. Wow, it's good to be here with you. It's always uh, a pleasure to be back here uh, at home at Thomasville Road Baptist Church. Uh, Tallahassee is my home, and, and uh, this is our, our home, our sending church. Uh, as we have been serving in Uganda now for over 14 years uh, at Good Shepherd's Fold, um, and we are just grateful for your partnership, for your prayers, uh, the special ways that you invest in our lives and our family. Um, I appreciate just a few moments to uh, share some of what God is doing uh, at Good Shepherd's Fold. Um, it is, uh, for those who are, are not familiar with the ministry, uh, it's, it's a ministry of child care and advocacy. Uh, it began as a children's home back in 1994, and uh, we have expanded now. We have education, nursery and primary school, and an international school all on the campus there, uh, a beautiful 120-acre campus that was given to us by Samaritan's Purse many years ago. Um, and then we have community development, reaching out in the community to try to address that brokenness uh, in the community uh, that, would, that would lead to children being placed into a children's home and trying to address those things uh, and build up families before uh, that brokenness grows to that uh, kind of point. Uh, so all of these things are in view of sharing the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ and seeing people uh, give their lives to Christ and, and walking with him. Um, and so that's a little bit about the ministry. Uh, if you are new to the ministry, uh, then uh, come and see us after. I have a few of these brochures. Some of you are on our mailing list. You'll get one of these in the mail very soon. Um, but uh, if you're new to the ministry and would like to know more about it, then come and see us afterward, and we'll uh, share that brochure uh, with you that tells a little bit more about us. Uh, I want to I tell you uh, a few hard things that have happened and a few things that we're rejoicing about uh, this year. 2022 has been a difficult year for us, uh, as it has been for many. Uh, we started just a few days into January with, uh, with the death of Amy's sister. Uh, she passed away from COVID, and uh, that was a very challenging uh, thing. In the midst of that, we found out that one of our uh, daughters, one of our children here in the States, was was not really walking with the Lord and, and making some poor decisions in life, and that has been uh, a burden on our hearts throughout, uh, throughout this year. Um, as we continued through the year, uh, Amy uh, has had problems with her eyes. Uh, she's had a, a, a condition of macular degeneration since she was young, which is very unusual, and yet it progressed to the point that was, it was affecting her vision, and, and uh, we're, uh, the doctors are a little bit baffled why it started so early uh, in life for her, and, um, and so she's been getting... Uh, injections and and treatment uh, for that condition in her eyes, and that's just been sort of an ongoing burden uh, throughout the year. Um, more recently, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, just before we came to the states for this for this six week period, um, we had to release one of our leaders. Uh, we discovered some uh, some fraudulent activity that was taking place, and um, and we had to let go someone that was a critical. Uh, peace in the ministry, and that just before we're leaving the country, uh, that has been uh, that has been uh, a challenge. And then just after we flew to the states, we arrived last Wednesday night, uh, a week uh, ago or ten days ago, uh, Wednesday night. Uh, and on Thursday morning, uh, we got word that one of the one of the children had passed away. One of the little boys with uh, special needs. We, he had been somewhat sick. Uh, just before we were leaving, and they took him to the hospital, and they ran tests, and everything was negative. They didn't understand what was happening, and, and, uh, and he passed away just within a few hours in the hospital. 
um, really suddenly, unexpectedly, and, and that hit us uh, very hard and, and wondering what, what's going on and knowing the team, our whole team of 12 missionaries and 100 children and the students in school, they're grieving over this situation and we weren't there uh, with them. And so that's heavy on our hearts uh, right now. I will tell you this about uh, John. The little boy's name is John. He, he's mute. Uh, he, he had constant seizures throughout his life and, and uh, he would show up at our house, which is not so far from his house on the campus. And he would, ju even about three weeks ago, he just showed up in our kitchen when we had some visitors there and snatched a cookie off of the counter and and uh, shoved it in his mouth before we, we all are thinking, what's happening? Where did he come from? Uh, his house mother commented and said, we would often uh, look around and just be like, John's gone. Where did he go? Like, just suddenly he's gone. And she said, and it was that way in his, in his passing also, like uh, that just we looked around and suddenly John was gone uh, we, as if we didn't even know what happened. But uh, these things are difficult and they are, they are challenging and and some of the uh, difficulties of mission life in general and, and just life uh, at large. Um, and so we've been going through, walking through these things. But in the midst of these things, uh, God is still good and he is still at work. I want to tell you that we've seen over 130 people give their lives to Jesus Christ in the ministry this year. This year. Amen to that. These are, these are students, these are uh, people in intentional outreach programs, and these are individuals that come and sit in an office, and maybe they're looking for help in some way, and they find uh, the ultimate help and transformation in Jesus Christ. And so they come to Christ all kinds of ways. Today, there are eight uh, teenagers uh, children in residence in the home, eight of them being baptized today. In fact, I keep getting pictures from our, uh, from our daughter, Carolina. Oh, here's another one. I can't look at that right now. But she's sending pictures of them being baptized in a river nearby, uh, not the Nile River, but a smaller river uh, nearby our ministry location, and they're being baptized today, giving their lives uh, to Jesus Christ and, and uh, just making that profession of faith. And that is something we just rejoice over and see God working in families that are being reunited uh, through the ministry and uh, students progressing in school after uh, schools were closed for two years uh, during COVID in Uganda. Uh, there, there are new staff joining us and, and stepping up in leadership, and uh, there are new facilities uh, being planned and being, uh, being laid out so that we can continue to do more and more. And, and just a few days ago, I got a phone call from a partner in ministry who said, uh, we want to participate in your uh, year-end uh, campaign, and we're contributing $190,000 uh, to Good Shepherd's Fold. It's the largest gift we've ever received and, and just kicks off our year-end campaign in an amazing way. And so God is at work. Um, and, and it says in John 16, it says, In this world you will have trouble. You will. We're not immune from all these troubles that come upon us. I've shared a few of them that we have faced, and I'm sure it conjures up images of the troubles that you have faced this year. In this world you will have trouble, but be of good courage, because Jesus Christ has overcome the world. His message is still going forth. Uh, his word is still being proclaimed. People's lives are still being transformed. And uh, we are grateful uh, for the partnership of Thomasville Road Baptist Church. We're grateful for your prayers and, and all those special gifts that come through. I send Steve these messages. There's, there's another bonus amount in, the, in that monthly support. And, and uh, just thank you, thank you for all the ways that you invest in our lives and the ministry. It's a joy to be with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mark. Um, if you ever get an opportunity today to talk to Mark, he is incredibly passionate and, and, and um, just has a great joy about the ministry that they get to do. And I thought that Mark's testimony and Mark and Amy's life are a perfect testimony and segue into the topic we have today. We are in week three of a, of a series called Prove It. Um, we're looking at the book of First John. We're specifically looking at it in the ways that it shows evidence of our faith and of our, our trust and our love to God and how we prove that out 
and how we live that out to God's glory and to his purposes. And today, we're going to be looking through at the proof of proving it through our obedience. One of the great proofs, I think, of Mark and Amy's faith in God is their obedience to God, to their call in their, their lives to love, to live, to minister, and to serve in Uganda. And, and they mentioned some of them. Mark did a perfect job. You know, every time I think of Mark, I think of he comes and he tells us a, a sad story for just a second. And he, and he tells us that they have had some times that they suffered and they've sacrificed much to be there. But yet they persist faithfully. And maybe, maybe even more amazingly, they persist with joy and with passion to continue what God has called them to. And I think they would probably agree with me, and so would most missionaries. They, would, they could not do what they do if it wasn't for their absolute faith in God. And they probably wouldn't do what they do if it wasn't for their faith in God. So Mark and Amy, we thank you for your obedience to God and all that you uh, do for all the different people that you touch their lives in Uganda. For the rest of you, you're probably thinking, man, it feels like Steve has talked about obedience for two years straight. Like every time I get up in this pulpit, it feels like I'm talking about obedience. And, and, and to some extent, you would be close. Uh, we have done a lot of talking about obedience, about serving God, about worshiping God, about abiding in God, following God, keeping God's word, and seeking God. And there are two very important reasons for that. The first one is that the Bible talks about this all of the time. From the beginning to the end, from genera generations, gen Genesis to Revelations, there are over 500 uses of the words walking in, following, obeying, seeking, abiding, serving, keeping, and worshiping God in Scripture. Five, over 500. And how we react and how we interact with God matters very much to God. Living a life in the, the way He desires and commands matters very much to God. And this leads us to the second reason. The second reason why we talk about obedience a lot is that we are really good at picking and choosing what and whom we want to obey, worship, serve, and follow, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to be reminded a lot and often that God is the only one worthy of our obedience and worship and that we will not share, he will not share our obedience and our worship with anyone or anything else. But today, we're going to look at obedience from the other side, okay? Where I'm not going to tell you a bunch of things that you are supposed to, how you are supposed to obey, and what you're supposed to obey, and the commands of God. We've done enough of that. I'm not going to talk to you about that. Well, instead, we're going to look at what a life lived in obedience, the proof of our faith and our love looks like, and what God desires from us. So let me pray, and then we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for Mark and Amy. I thank you for their ministry. I thank you for the example that they are to us. I thank you for the example so many are that, Lord, have given their lives in obedience to you to go into another country, into another place, or to another culture, Lord, and just to give their lives to you so that you may be glorified and you may be honored. And we just thank you for them. We thank you for their example. But, Lord, we also ask, Lord, that we would seek you and we would live a life that is obedient to you and to your word and to your promises and to your, to your demands and to your, or to your commands and your desires for us, Lord. And, Lord, as we read your word today, just help us to see that part of the way that we prove our love and our trust to you is through our obedience, Lord. It's in your holy, precious name we pray. Amen. So now, back in January... Uh, in February of 2021, right when me and Marty started to preach on a, on a weekly basis, we did a very short four-week series on the book of 1 John. I had actually forgotten about it, and then I was looking it over this week and saw that, and we taught it from a completely different viewpoint, a completely different lens. We were talking specifically about who God is, who Jesus is, who man is, and how we are to love one another. And so if you're interested in that part of 1 John, you can always go to our website and go back to those sermons. They were probably pretty bad. It was two years ago. We've had a lot of practice since then. But uh, anyhow, if you want to see it from that perspective, those are available to you as well as all of our sermons at all the time. But it, what, what happened today, though, this week, though, is what happens a lot, um, is that I am asked to preach on the exact same passage that I preached two years ago almost. And so, um, but when I preached on it back then, I preached on it from a different viewpoint. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 John 2, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> and it says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. 
And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. The last time I preached this passage, I was focusing more on the commandment to love, to love God and to love one another, which immediately follows in 1 John 2, 7 through 11. Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. And he said the second is like it, to love others as yourself. And I'm not here to refute that, so please hear me say that. I will tell you that the greatest calling, and it is both at the center and the foundation of our total obedience in God, is our love for God and our love for others. Our purpose today, however, is that we're going to look at the proof of our faith. How we love God and how we love others is most definitely a proof of our love for God. Love is at the heart of our obedience, and obedience is at the heart of God, our love. It's a little bit like who came first, the chicken or the egg. Because God loves us and because we love God, we are obedient to God. And conversely, the evidence of that love is our obedience. Obedience and love are not easily separated. And when they are, they are almost always less than they were meant to be. To love God and not to be obedient to God puts into question if we truly love God. I'm going to give you a little uh, illustration. It's a little humorous and a little lighter, but, but it kind of flows in that. Many, many years ago, uh, my, when my daughter, oldest daughter, sitting right here, Emily, was two and a half years old, um, we were, I was a youth pastor at that point in time, and I was about to do a youth lock-in that night. And so that night I decided I would let Emily stay up with me a little bit longer because I, wasn't gonna, I was going to be ruined for the next day. I was going to be tired. I was not going to have a whole lot of energy for her. So I let her stay up. So it was about 8, 15, 8, 30, and, and she was well past her bedtime, and me and her are sitting out in the living room with, with her grandmother, and we're sitting out there, and, and I said, hey, Peach, and that's my nickname for her. I said, it's time to go to bed. And so Emily kind of looks at me, and she jumps up on the platform that it, creates our fireplace, which she wasn't supposed to be on. We told her that it's unsafe to be up there. She jumps up, kind of sticks out her arm, puts her arms on her hips, sticks out her hiney just a little bit, puts her face right in my face and goes, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> and I remember my first, my first reaction was I laughed. I laughed really hard. It was adorable. It would fit her personality so perfectly, and I was just like going, that's exactly what I would expect my Emily to say during something like that. But my second impression was, did my child just openly disobey her father who had so lovingly let her stay up so he could spend time with her? And the answer was yes, she did. And I love my daughter dearly. I love both my daughters dearly, but I also know that she, they both need to obey their father and their mother when we want what's best for them. And we treat our God, our love of God sometimes, and our obedience in God a lot like this. We love God. God loves us, and he blesses us, and he provides for us, and he comforts us, and he protects us, and he wants good things for us. But when we don't like or agree with one of his commands or his desires and purpose for us, we put our hands on our hips, and we puff out our chest, and we say, well, I don't know about that. Or we say something worse, maybe. We say, no way am I doing that or I am not going to do what I don't want to do. And you know, this can be kind of understandable or allowable for a two-year-old, but not for a grown, professed lover and follower of God. So likewise, to simply obey God without loving God is a cold, obligation-based and works-based relationship at best. This passage, though, tells us that the proof of our love for God is our obedience to God. And it begins with God's proof for his love for us. In 1 John 2, 1 through 2, he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous, he is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. God loved us by sending his Son, his Son Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 
any question, any doubt that we have that God loves us or the lengths that he would go to show that love are ended in the sending and saving work of his son, Jesus Christ. And how are we to respond to this love? We do so in love. We do so in faith and in trust in God, which leads to our obedience. As we see in, in 1 John 2, 3 through 6, and he says, And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By that, this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And so there are two key things that happen for us and happen around us when we are, when we are obedient to, in response to God's love for us. First of all, God's love is perfected. How is it perfected? God's intention for man has always been a love relationship with man. He loves us unconditionally. He is the source of all of our needs. He is the source of all truth. He is the source of all that is good. And we are created to recognize this and to love him and to obey him and to worship him. Obedience is the highest expression of our love for God. We acknowledge that he is God and he is God alone. The second thing is we are to abide in him. Abide is John's favorite definition or, de or way to describe the fact that we are to give our lives and everything that we have to God in recognition that he is the absolute source of all that we need. When we abide in him, we walk in his ways. We will look to him. We will think like him. We will act like him. We will seek to be holy as our Father in heaven is holy. And you know, John didn't make this up. This isn't words coming out of John's mouth. This isn't some interpretation of something he thought maybe Jesus said. Jesus actually said words similar to this in John 15, 1 through 5. He said, I am the, vine, the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, and it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing." It means that our obedience, how we live out our lives for God's glory comes from one source and one source alone, and that is God's love and desire for our lives. Amen. There is no allusion to or no allowance made for any other source of our love and our obedience. Yes, we are to love others. Yes, we are going to have to be obedient to some other authorities in our lives. But if God is not the source and focus of our lives, and if our obedience to others and our love to others doesn't point to his glory and to his kingdom, it is not godly love and obedience. So how do we abide? Okay, This is not rocket science. You all can probably figure this out and probably already know what I'm about to say. But if we are going to live in response to God's love through obedience, we have to know God. We have to know his word. We have to spend time with him. We have to align our lives to his, life, his ways. We need to love God. We need to love his ways, and we need to love his purposes and plans for our lives. This is our proof of our obedience. This is our proof of our love and our faith in God. This is how we prove it to God is through our obedience. And what does this look like? Well, fortunately for us, God gives us an entire chapter in the Bible that describes the proof of obedience in the lives of those who were being obedient because of their faith and love in God. In Hebrews 11, sometimes called the roll call of faith, there is a perfect illustration or multiple perfect illustrations of the proof of a life lived in obedience to God. As love and obedience go hand in hand, so does faith and obedience. Why would we obey someone or something that we did not have faith in? And why would we have faith in someone or something that we did not love or did not love us? I'm not going to read all this passage because it's quite lengthy, but I do want to highlight what we can take from both the writer's description of faith and how persons mentioned in the text prove their love and faith to God and their obedience. So let me begin with a definition of faith as given by the writer of Hebrews in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for, 
By faith, we understand that the universe was formed by God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. And this really is less a definition and more of a description of what faith does and how it works. Warren Wiersbe summed up this passage in saying, True biblical faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances or consequences. So essentially, in this passage, God is saying that God, I, God speaks. We hear him and we trust his word no matter what, period. And you know, this might be frightening. This might take us into the unknown, that we are, take us out of our comfort zone, but we obey just the same because we believe him to do what is right and what is best. Amen. Faith does three things that we see in this passage. Faith accepts God's word. It says, now faith is being sure of, and the word translated for being sure of is the word hypostasis. Its intended meaning is to denote, denote communica and communicate substance, firmness, confidence, a collection of documents establishing ownership, and a guarantee of proof. It might be best translated as, now faith is resolute confidence in. Okay? And then the second part of this verse uses the word elenchus, which is translated as certain of what we do not see, and the word elenchus could be translated as conviction. So what's the difference between a thought and an opinion and a conviction? Some will stand by an opinion, but if I really, or if me or somebody else were really to put the screws to you or, or put something on that opinion that is going to be of great value to you, a lot of times we'll relent from that opinion. A conviction, on the other hand, is a living, active belief in the life of a person. People will die for a conviction. It is part of who they are. The writer is saying that we can have resolute confidence and conviction, but in what? That which is hoped for and that which we do not see. These are the promises and words of God. Faith is accepting God's words and promises, whether it comes to fruition or not, because we have resolute confidence in Him, and we are convinced of who He is, what He says, and whom He says that He is is true. Number two, faith wins God's approval. Hebrews 12, 2 doesn't use a whole lot of words, but it says a lot. It says, this is what the ancients were commended for. It was faith in their response to God's word in obedience that won God's approval. Realize I did not say that one is love. They already had his love. I didn't say that one is their salvation. That would only come through Jesus Christ, but his approval or his commendation. I don't know about you, but I can't think of anything I would want more than to stand before Jesus and hear him say the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then third, faith recognizes God's power. Verse 3 brings us to the point of faith where we often fail the most. It is that God is in control and that God is all-powerful. The verse uses creation and God's ability to create everything that we can see out of what we can't see. Otherwise, meaning he made everything out of nothing to demonstrate his sovereignty and his omnipotence. Our belief in God as creator is one of faith and faith alone. We must have faith that God's word is true, faith that God can do anything, and that faith, or faith that God has power and control over anything. The rest of Hebrews 11 tells of the faith of many great men and women of the Old Testament. The writer intends, these to, or intends that these heroes of faith be examples to us. As we look at this list, I want to point out a couple things to you. I'm not going to read the, all of Hebrews 11. It's a long list, and I, and I would encourage you to go home and to read that. But as you are reading it, and as we are discussing I want you to think about these couple things. These people were not perfect. Their obedience was not perfect. Some of them blew it, and blew it big time. There was Noah, who got drunk and slept naked in the open. Abraham, who lied about his wife and, and allowed, gave her to another man to save his own life. Isaac, who favored one son over another. Jacob, who deceived his father. Moses, who killed a man. And the Israelites of the Exodus, who were bickering, grumbling, idol-worshiping group of malcontents. Rahab was a prostitute. Samson was arrogant and foolish. Gideon and Barak were doubtful. Jephthah was so rash and loose of his vows that it came at the expense of his daughter's life. And David was an adulterer. On paper, these people don't seem so good. But the love of God and their faith and obedience to God held in the end when it mattered. The great thing about faith and obedience is that it transforms the lives of those who have it. 
With that said, God uses people despite their imperfections and disobedience. We do not earn God's love, nor do we earn the ability to be used by God. We are given by God the strength and equipping to be used for his glory and purposes. This list is also not comprehensive of everyone who God commends for their faith and obedience. If you read this list, you will think of a lot of names that God could have put on this list from the Old Testament that are not in there. There are people that we have never heard about that might have been commended by God for their faith and obedience that are just not in our scripture. Also, each of these persons express faith and obedience in a unique response to God's love and their context. Obedience does not always look the same for everyone everywhere. What then did their faith and obedience look like? I want to look at the biblical description that they give throughout this. First of all, one, their faith and obedience involved confident action. Almost every person mentioned in this passage heard God and acted on what they heard. And why or how did they hear from God? Because out of their love of God, they put themselves in the proximity of God and positioned their hearts to hear from God. They were purposefully humble, dependent, and open to God's moving and directing in their lives. Number two, is their faith and obedience to our actions taken in response to the unseen God and his promises? They did not just have confident action in their own abilities or things they could see or control or comprehend, but their actions taken were in response to the unseen moving of God. And you know what? To this day, this is still something that other people will ridicule you for doing. When you react to a God that can't be seen, who you're just being obedient to because you heard his voice, and others say, I don't hear his voice, but you're going to continue to do it, you're going to get the same ridicule today that many of these people got during that period of time. Number three, faith and obedience involves God working extraordinary miracles, actions, and outcomes in the lives of ordinary people. These were real people who had real lives, and who made real, sometimes really, really big mistakes. But because of their faith and obedience, God was able to work in them and through them. And fourthly, faith and obedience works in a variety of situations. Very few of these stories have the same setting. In fact, some of these settings that you might think when we think about faith, like the doing of miracles or the casting out of demons or of healing someone, are not even mentioned here at all. Faith and obedience, and I want you to hear this, faith and obedience are applicable and work in every situation, not just the miraculous. Number five, faith may have a variety of outcomes. It's important to notice that though um, at times their faith had an immediate positive outcome, that was not always the case. Abel was still murdered. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Moses never saw the promised land. Samson died right alongside the Philistines. And some, as the scripture says, were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might see rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, and they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, etc., Western Christianity often wants us to to believe the fact that if we have faith, good things will happen to us. But that is not necessarily a biblical truth or a biblical picture. You may not receive the rewards of your faith in this life. Verse six, or number six, is that faith and obedience are always commended by God. In the end, we can say faith and obedience involves people who love and trust God, aligning their lives with God, his promises, and his word, even if they are contrary to the reality and the values of the world in which we live in. We have Abel who worshiped God in faith, Enoch who walked in faith, Noah who worked in faith, the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph who waited in faith for the promises of God's covenant. Moses, who led in faith, and others such as Joshua, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets, whom all did God's will in their situation with faith. We see that they did amazing and unexplainable things for God, but we also see that they were often received by the world with negative and harsh ways. They were tortured, flogged, imprisoned, jeered, stoned, sawn in two, and put to the death by the sword. They were destitute, persecuted, mistreated, and lived and dressed as animals. 
But in all these situations and circumstances, what mattered most was God and his ultimate promise of salvation and eternity with him in heaven. Hebrews eleven thirty nine 39 through 40 ends this passage by saying, In all these things, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. So what they thought was promised was not what they received. What they received, it says, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. We see the same thing in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from this world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Our focus and our obedience are not to this world. They are not to the concerns of this world, but they are to the God who loves us and his perfect promise and reality of salvation and eternity with him. If we obey, if we do the will of God, we will abide with him. We will be with him. We will enjoy his presence, and we will grow in him forever. So does our obedience offer proof of our love and trust in God? Do we live in a way that our lives could be added to this roll call? So we need to ask ourselves, how would I live today if I believed absolutely that God existed and loved us completely and had a place for us greater than any in this world? How would I live if I believed that God cared about every aspect of my life? How would I live if I knew that God would someday reward my faith and obedience? How would I live in the face of opposition if I really believed in God, really believed with all of my heart that God is who he says that he is? And most of us would answer, I do. I do believe absolutely. I believe with my whole heart. I believe with all that I am that God is who he says he is. And then I would ask you, how would you live differently if you didn't believe? Would there be much difference in your life? Would, you obey, would your obedience be less the same? Would your life look any different than the neighbors that you have that do not love and trust God? Our love and trust in God, lived out in obedience, changes lives. It changes our lives. And living in faith and obedience should stimulate others to faith and obedience. Living in faith and obedience should scream, Hey, world! Look and see this God that I follow, that I have faith in, that I am obedient to. He is real, and he is worthy, and he is good, and he is in control. And don't you want to know him just like I know him? I want to close with Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Faith and obedience leads us to consider three things. We are to consider those that have gone before us. We are to look at the proof of others. And I regret that I left a painting on my wall. I took it down this morning, laid it next to my door, and walked away without it. But I have a picture on my wall. This gives you all an excuse to come visit my office. But uh, uh, and on this picture, it was, it was uh, when I was at Beeson Divinity School. Uh, they were, had just built a new chapel, and on the dome, they asked this um, kind of famous painter to come and paint this mural around the dome and the mural is based on this verse of that, that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and there's pictures of Martin Luther and there's pictures of, of, of all the different reformers and, and St. Augustine and different people that are all sitting there and they took that picture and they made it into a lithograph and they spread it out and I have that on my wall uh, and that's the only thing I kind of keep that reminds me anything of college and, 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 and seminary, but I, I love that picture. But I look at that picture and I think that that picture is not exactly what the Bible speaks here. 
When I look at that picture, I see a bunch of spectators sitting up on top of a little dome watching me live out my life and trying to live out my life in faith. And that is not what the Bible says here. What the Bible says here is that they are encouragers, they are rooters, they are in this with you. They have walked where you are walked and they are continued in faith and obedience. And they are right there alongside of you. They're supporting you and cheering you on in your faith and obedience. They are examples to us and the accounts of their faith and obedience should spur us on. And then he says we are to consider ourselves. They are rooting for and encouraging us, but we are responsible for running the race. We have to be prepared. We have to train. We have to remove the things in our lives that keep us and may keep us from finishing the race and finishing strong. If you watch any track and field, actually a lot of sports, but track and field specifically, the uniforms just get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, and, but it's because they want every edge that they can get. Anything that weighs them down or constricts them has to go. When I was a kid, and I think I've told you all this story in the past. That some, when I was a kid, I, there was an outfielder that played for the Yankees, who I can't stand because I'm an Oriole fan, but, but uh, he played for the Yankees. His name was Oscar Gamble, and I loved to watch Oscar Gamble. He had an awesome fro. That was part of it. But he also, in the batter's box, he would pick up this 12-pound sledgehammer, and he would swing this sledgehammer. Now, he swung the sledgehammer because when he was swinging something that heavy, when he grabbed his 36-ounce bat, 38-ounce bat, it felt really light in his hands. Now, as cool as it was to watch Oscar Gamble swing a sledgehammer in the batter's box, Oscar would have never walked up to the plate with that sledgehammer in hand because he couldn't have swung it fast enough to hit any pitch that would have came his way. But it was really cool when you're a 10-year-old kid. So there are a lot of good things, though, in our lives that keep us from faith and obedience. There are a lot of worldly messages that seem appealing and right that keep us from faith and obedience. And there is sin that keeps us from faith and obedience. And the writer here is unspecific, but he says any sin or anything that distracts or takes you away from God's purposes entangles us and keeps us from living out a life of faith and obedience. Look back to the portion in Hebrews 11 about Cain and Abel. And it says, why was Abel's offering accepted and Cain's was not? Abel... Uh, gave what the Lord asked, and Cain gave what he thought he could get away with. How many of us go through our lives just giving God what we thought we could get away with? Not what was absolutely commanded or, or desired from biblical faith and obedience that God demands and empowers us to do. The third thing we are to consider is to consider Jesus. How do we live out our faith and our love and obedience to God? How do we live out the perfect example of Jesus Christ? We do it through Jesus Christ. Jesus went through more than we ever will and kept his faith. That was obedience, and he kept his focus firmly fixed on God. I know Jesus was the Son of God, and so it seems like he had an extra boost or help or advantage in that. But we have to remember that when he was here walking amongst us, he was completely man. He was tempted just like us. He was hurt just like us. He bled like us, and he died like we will. I love how Eugene Peterson puts this verse in, in, in the message, which is a paraphrase of the Bible. It's not a translation, but he says, when you find yourself flagging in your faith, go over the story of Jesus again, item by item. That long litany of hostility he plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your soul. A lot of us need a shot of adrenaline. Remember, life and faith and obedience is so much more than us just doing what we know how to do or doing what we think we can accomplish or we can control on our own. It is living on the edge of expectation and confidence that absolute obedience and absolute surrender to God and His ways is not only an option, but in fact, it is the best and most spectacular way to live. This is the way we were created to live. So love God. If we love God, then prove it. Prove it by your faith and your obedience. And we don't wait for that perfect moment. We don't wait until we have ourselves or our lives in order to prove it. We prove our obedience in everything, in every situation, big, small, and in between. So the next time God, or his, through his word, moves in you to a certain action, let's not answer with, well, I don't know about that. But let's answer proudly and, and, and joyfully and with confidence and say, yes, sir, I will. Yes, Lord, I will. And so uh, as we think about obedience and we think about the idea of the fact that our response to God should always be yes. Our response to God should always be yes, Lord. 
The first response that we have in saying yes, Lord, is always in faith to Jesus Christ. Uh, the first time that anybody will ever say yes, Lord, is believing that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins on the cross, that he was buried and rose again on the third day to overcome death so that we can have eternal life. And if there's anybody in here who's never said, yes, Lord, I believe in you. I believe that you came and died for my sins, and I need forgiveness, and I want eternity with you. I would love to have a conversation with you. So as we sing and as we, as we continue to service, please come talk to me. But for a lot of us, it just we, we, we need to live out our lives in proof through our obedience. We say we love God, and I believe you. I honestly do believe that most of the people in this room love God and are doing their best to love God. But God calls us to love him through our obedient actions to the things he calls us to. And sometimes those things he calls us to, we don't want to do. And we might say, well, I don't know about that. But God's saying, I just want you to say, yes, Lord, I will. And so as we sing and you think about that, if you want to come and pray, you can pray. Let me pray real quick, and then we will continue and sing. Dearly Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, for us. And we ask, Lord, that with all that you do for us and all that you have given us and all the ways you have blessed us, Lord, that when you call upon us and we hear your voice, Lord, that our answer would be yes, Lord. It's in your holy precious name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please? The riches of this world will fade. The treasures of our God remain. But here I empty myself to owe this world nothing and find everything in you. The riches of this world will fade. The treasures of our God remain. But here I empty myself to all this world, nothing, and find everything in you. I surrender, I surrender, I surrender all to you. seated for just a second. I want to give you a couple, three real quick things um, before we leave. One is uh, we have, um, we sent an email on Monday, but we have recommendations for the elder, initial elder selection committee. Now, this is not for elders, okay? This is the committee that will choose the elders. It's very much like a pastor search committee in the fact that they're going to be looking at the people that are nominated within our body to become elders of our church. So they're going to have to do some hard work. We want you to nominate people that you think are capable and, and, and worthy of doing that. So there are nomination sheets out in the foyer on the welcome desk. There's a basket right there. You can put them in there or in the offering plate, or you can email Amy Harper at Amy Harper at Thomas road.org at any time this week. We are taking those all the way to Friday, and then they will be given to the deacons who will start that process. So I just want to make you aware of that. Also, um, we, we are collecting some things. We haven't made this really public. We've done more of uh, written advertisements. We are collecting some, some household goods, diapers, diaper wipes, that kind of thing for Making Miracles Group Home, which is a home that helps single moms uh, get back on their feet. If you would like to bring something in, you can bring that out. There's a table right back here that you can put those on or you can bring them to my office. There's some in my office right now, but we'll be collecting those for the next week or two. So if you would like to bring that, we would love to have that. We also realize that there is a tropical storm, possible hurricane that could be coming towards our way this week. We are going to continue to monitor, monitor that. We will continue to communicate with you as we hear more. Um, if if we are, there is needs, we will send out requests for help and volunteer teams to go help other people. If something is going to be canceled throughout the week, we will let you know. Uh, we just don't have enough information right now because of where the storm is. So as that comes along, we will continue to communicate with you as needed. So, uh, so thank you all for being here. You're dismissed. <clears throat>